All right, Facebook, YouTube. It's Malak Bama Shah back at you again on this Holy Shabbat. Sabbath day. But this day is not only just a Sabbath day. This day is the third, first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We observed Passover yesterday. And I know that uh, for those that have knowledge of Passover, of the calendar, that may keep the United calendar or Jubilees or any other calendar that, that I keep, that your holy day might be a little different. Even, uh, even Israel that has a similar calendar that I got, they're keeping their Passover on the April the 20 something next month, around this time, April 24th, I think. Uh, it's really something because I go by the calendar, the uh, lunar solar calendar, which basically is right with the uh, the Jewish calendar, except the Jewish calendar uh, looks at the first sliver of the moon. First sliver of the moon is being uh, the new moon. You know, I've, I've been there and done it. I've, I've, I've observed Friday sundown, Saturday sundown, Sabbath. Saturday, Sabbath, and now I've been observing the uh, lunar solar calendar for the last 15 years, I think, I believe. You know, it's been quite a while. But I do believe that the calendar that really coincides, that, uh, that does not betray the Bible, is the lunar solar calendar. And besides, what calendar did uh, Adam and Eve have? On the soul. All right, they didn't, they, yeah, I didn't give them a, a calculated calendar where they can mark off the days and all of that. You know, he gave them the sun and the moon. All right, with the new moon being the, the dark moon. All right, so my wife and I, we studied this. We studied all the Sabbaths. We tried it. The one that we found to be the accurate one is the one we're talking about now. So we uh we we got a calendar. We kind of like WLC World's the Last Chance calendar. They write with it too. And we don't go by what color a person is, what color organization is. If they're right, they're right, you know. If somebody that's not even what we call a Hebrew Israelite is doing the right thing according to the Bible, say amen, you know. And, and copy. If you're not doing it, this should basically be a, a word for you. You know what I'm saying? When you read the Bible, if you got a book, a Bible, uh, the pages are white and the words are black. So there you go. You know, you, you, uh, you can read a Bible from other people too. No matter what color, what heritage they have, they doing right, they doing right. That's a, that's a blessing of Yah for you. Especially if you're a Hebrew Israelite. All right? If they're talking right, world's last chance of saying the right thing, amen. You know, that's Yah leading you to the truth. You know? But uh, not only world's last chance believe in the, the lunar solar calendar, there's many Hebrew Israelites that believe in that do the dark moon. And, you know, they know to do the dark moon. Because if it's, if it's a new moon, the new moon has got to become dark before it becomes sliver and all of that. And before we can even see a light on the moon is there. That means the moon is new before we can even see it, that it's new. So that's why we say the dark moon, because once it gets dark, then it goes to the other side, the light immediately goes to the other side of the moon and it starts, uh, what is it called? Uh, uh, when, it's, when it's less and when it's getting less of light, what is that called? When the when the moon gets less light constantly every day, that's waning, right? When the moon gets more light every day, what's that called? Waxing. All right. So after it wanes all the way out, once it wanes all the way out, that's the that's the new moon because once the light is gone from that side of the moon, it goes to the other side. And believe it or not, so I heard some people saying the the moon gets its light from the sun. Uh no. 
No, the, the moon has its own light. And that's surprising. That should be surprising to most people. If we bought up in school to believe that the, that the moon gets its light from the sun. But I've seen the sun in the sky and the moon in the sky at the same time. And I, and you know, the moon, if the sun, if the moon got its light from the sun, then it, it should be a full moon, right? The moon is in the sky at the same time as the sun is. We should see a full moon. But how in the world can we see the sun in the sky and the moon in the sky at the same time when it's a quarter or a half moon or one of the other moon faces that ain't full? It don't make any sense. So right there is telling us that the moon has its own light. It's like the sun has its own light. The sun does not get its light from anywhere else but Yahweh. So likewise, the moon gets its light from Yahweh. All right? And in Genesis chapter 1, it says, he set two great lights in the sky, the sun and the moon. All right? And the stars don't get their light from the sun or the moon. They have their own light. You know? And uh, believe it or not, I'm going to say something here that's going to rock some people's world. That the earth is bigger than the sun and the moon, according to Genesis chapter 1. According to Genesis chapter 1, that, yeah, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's no big giant moons and suns and stars out there, billions and billions and trillions of miles out there. It's not like that. All right? So he created the, the, the heavens and the earth. All right? And what you see in the day of creation, those days of creation, he created the sun and the moon and the stars on the fourth day. All right. But uh, when you study this, it's the earth that's huge and humongous. All right. The earth is huge. And uh, just like the ancients used to believe that the earth had pillars, it set on pillars, they had water in it all around it, and over the top of it with the permanent. The ancients were correct. It's us that's all messed up. All right. It's, 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 the, it's the world, the people, man. That has lost the knowledge. The Hebrew Israelites that basically, you know, encountered Yahweh basically told us this. That the earth has pillars, it's flat, not totally flat, like a pancake. It has mountains and islands and hills and all of that. But other than that, it's more on the flat side. It's not round like a round ball spinning through the air so many miles an hour and traveling through the air so many miles an hour that you would, that you would think is crazy without, without slinging water out of it. Well, because of gravity, it doesn't sling water. Well, just if you're listening to this video, take a look in your head uh, with, your, with your attention span. Look around you. Do you sense that you're going through this outer space so many thousands of miles an hour? Do you sense that you're spending so many thousand miles an hour? Okay, then basically, then if you don't sense it, it must not be. All right? Because some people say, well, just because you don't sense something, that don't mean it exists. That's true. But if we was going through space so many miles an hour and spending so many miles an hour, I think we would know it. I think we would, we feel like we're on a roller coaster or something. All right? But just like the ancient Hebrews told us, throughout the scriptures. They never said that we're on a ball spinning through space many miles an hour. All right, never said that. Never gave us a hint like that. All right, the earth is more like a flat unit, but it's got pillars, it sits up. All right, but the earth is bigger than the sun and the moon. The sun and the moon were made to circuit the earth and provide sunlight on this part of the earth why that part of the earth over there is a little dark. But don't worry about it. The sun is coming over there sooner or later. All right? The sun is one that's traveling through the air, through space. The, moon, the, the, earth, is, the earth is still. It's not traveling through outer space or anything. It's not, it's, it's not moving. It's, that's what you sense when you sense you're on this earth. You just take a look. You just, just, take a, just take a break and sense around you. You sense the earth is not moving. And that's true. The earth is not moving. The sun and the moon 
are moving. All right. And if you if you say, hey, if how in the world can the can the moon uh cover the sun and cause an eclipse? Well, guess what? The sun and the moon are pretty much the same size. They're created in the sky around the same size. They're discs. You cannot land on the moon, you cannot land on the sun. They're discs. All right? They were made to be lights. All right? They're discs. And you know, when you look up in the sky, you notice the constellations, the stars. You ever know you ever notice though the earth they say the earth is moving all around the place? You never see the other end of the, of the stars, the other side of the stars. You never see a side of stars that you've never seen before. You always see the same constellations. All right? That means that everything is right there. It's gritty. What you see is what you get. There's no backside of the stars, nothing that you've never seen. So the earth is still. God created the firmament and he placed all those stars and all those lights in the firmament. That's why the firmament is blue because it has water in it. All right, go ahead. If you can, let it be. And then, yeah, right there. So it has water in the firmament. The firmament is hard. So what the creation of Yah did, he did a great creation. Permanent is hard, all right? So when they say they went to the moon, they went up there and they walked on the moon. Well, in 1969, I was about a four or five year old kid. We kind of believe that. And I'm gonna tell you something else we believe. We believe that champ championship wrestling was real, not fake. All right, and then later on we found out all that stuff is fake. But for a five, four or five year old kid, it's real. They don't wanna, re they don't wanna realize it's fake. All right, when we grew, we got growing up, you know, 10, 12, 11, 12 years old, and we started playing football and basketball, all right? And we noticed that that a lot of the, the football and basketball uh, news was on the news, on, on the sports. But we started to notice that championship wrestling was not on sports. And then later on, maybe, you know, years down the road, WWE and WWF came in, all right? And they had WrestleMania and they kind of would put it on the news, on the sports news. All right, but we found out eventually that it wasn't real. Neither is the moon landing real as fake. Fake is championship wrestling. When, when people bought it to the folks, they said it was real and that basically were in charge of filming the moon landing. You know what they said? Well, that was fake. But the reason why we, we filmed it like that, because we, we had lost connection with the people landing on the moon. So, so, that the, so that the people can see what was going on, we televised it from Houston. Uh, yeah, they said that, all right? <laughs> now I, can't, I cannot just give you the, the accurate video that said it, but that's what they said, all right? That because they lost the footage, they had to televise it. And an acting scenario from Houston. So what you see with the first people saying, you know, getting off, getting off of the, the spaceship, saying one, one foot for man, one foot for man, one step of mankind and all of that stuff, the ego has landed. What you see is an enactment going on in Houston. All right? You're not looking at them people really landing on the moon. All right? And they said that they lost the footage, but they really landed on the moon. Okay, yeah, right. All right, why haven't they gone back to the moon? Huh? They said that they lost the technology. No, come on now. All right, my favorite wrestler, championship wrestler, was Dick the Bruiser. You can look on the, on YouTube and find Dick the Bruiser, Crusher. I'm telling you, that was some good entertainment. And even WWF, WWE, whatever it's called today, you get on there and you get caught up into that. It's like watching a soap opera, and it's good entertainment. All right, I I might go ahead and start watching me some more wrestling matches real soon. All right. But I got some swamp land for y'all that believe that the moon landing was real. Got some swamp land in Florida for you, selling it for so much money. Just get in touch with me sooner or later. All right? Sooner or later, get in touch with me. You can buy some swamp land. You can turn it into, into, into some uh, cultivated land. Take the water off of it. 
You can do whatever you want to do with it. If you want to keep it swamp, you can keep it swamp. But, uh, you know, just joking. I mean, try to take advantage of people's mentality. I think that I can. All right? I'm not that type of person. But I'm just saying it like that to let you know that some things that this world had to see. And we see in the scriptures that it says, Satan deceiveth the whole world. All right? What's that scripture? I put that in there. Put that in the search and deceive the whole world. Search right there. Deceive it. That's S. Deceive it. Don't put Satan in there. Just put deceive it. Deceive it. The whole world. All right, go ahead. Okay, you deceive it, might be. Uh, uh, right. Take out the word deceiver. Okay. Press press your enter. All right. Go all the way down. It might be in Revelation. Go all the way down. Revelation 12, 9. Right there. All right, and it says in Revelation 12, 9, and the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan was deceived the whole world. So he deceived the whole world. Greek 4105, for the word deceive. Means uh, the word is pleneo, pleneo. Uh, probably to cause to roam. To cause to roam. From safety, truth, or virtue. So this is what Satan does. He causes you to roam like a wandering bird from safety, from truth, or virtue. To go astray, to deceive, to err, to seduce, so to wander, to be out of the way. So any lie will cause this to happen. And a lie on top of a lie will cause the whole world to be deceived. Go ahead and mark that out of there. So one of the lies that we have is that the world is round and it's flying through space along with the sun and the moon and nine or ten other planets with it. All right? That's one of the lies. All right? And what you should ask is, how do you know that? How do you know we're flying through outer space at so many miles an hour, twisting, spinning at so many miles an hour, and we're following we in a gravitational pull of the sun, which a hundred Earths can get into, can, can, can fit into. How do you know that? All right. I tell you what, somebody got a heck of a, uh, heck of a fantasy world that they, that they use in their head. All right. Heck of an imagination is the word, imagination. But this, that Satan has to be behind it. Why would Satan tell the whole world that uh, the Earth is, is gravitationally revolving around a sun that's humongous, a star that's humongous, along with a along with a moon, a moon that's that's gravitationally encircling the Earth, and then we're all flying through outer space? Why would Satan do that? So that when you read Genesis chapter one, you would doubt it. When you read Genesis chapter one, you without it. Go to Genesis real quick. That's why Satan will tell you that. So you would doubt it with what your idea in Genesis one. Scroll down. Go back up to verse 14. All right. Genesis 1 14, God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven, right there. The word firmament should make you wonder, just to stop you right off the bat. Let there be lights in the firmament. Then you might say, what is a firmament? Hit, hit that word, Hebrews 75, 49. Rakia. Rakia. That's probably how you say it in Paleo Hebrew. Modern Hebrew is Rakia. All right? But in Paleo Hebrew is Rakia. You know, if you want to name somebody a name, probably, hopefully a son, they remember Akaya, which means permanent. 
all right? Hebrew, that's a Hebrew name, Rakaya, all right? But that word Rakaya in Hebrew means an expanse. That is the firmament, or apparently a visible arch in the sky, firmament. And notice it said arch in the sky, visible arch in the sky. When you look up there, sometimes you don't notice that there's an arch in the sky. All right, but basically the Hebrew language tells us that that firmament is an arch. All right, and uh, so if it's an arch, it has a beginning point and an ending point, and it has an arch. That means a a, a point where it's highest highest. Um, my 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 father and mother came from St. Louis, Missouri. They're not originally from there, but they married there and started their ministry from, from St. Louis, Missouri, all right? And uh, we would go back there sometime to visit relatives. And before, we, before we can get 50 miles away from St. Louis, you can see the arch. The arch has a beginning point on the ground and it has, a, it has an ending point on the other side. It's a giant arch, all right? So you can imagine that the Hebrew word tells you it's an arch. The arch in St. Louis is not exactly the same as the firmament, but it has a beginning point and ending point. That means that the that that the earth has a point where the where the firmament, you can see it on the ground. All right. You can see it on the ground. Like when we go to St. Louis, we go to the arch because we I went up in that arch. You know, it, it's really something else. You go all the way up to the top, you look out. All right. But while you're waiting to go up there, you can you can hang out at one of the base points. You know, you see a lot of people writing their names, you know, graffiti and all of that at the base, the two bases that's holding the arch up. All right. But there is a beginning point of the arch in the sky, the permanent. And there's the other side of the, you know, it's basically the arch basically is all around the earth. It's around, it's around it. All right, but it has a beginning point and the end point. It has an arch in the sky. It has a point in the sky where it's highest. Go ahead, let it in. And mid. has a point in the sky where it's highest. All right, so right off the bat, when you look at this, you know, uh, that God created this, this uh, permanent in the sky. So, so you can get, get out of that. So God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven. So basically, we know that if you go, if you jump in the sky, you jump 10 foot, you're in heaven, your second heaven. You get an airplane and fly, guess what you're in? You're in the second heaven. All right? It's the heaven that's on the earth. All right? Uh, so let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven. We divide the day from the night. So this firmament is in the heaven, the second heaven. It's not in the third heaven, all right? It's in the second heaven. So many miles up in the air, all right? And it's basically, what well, you can see through it is see through, but it's as hard as a, as a metal. And how y'all made that, I don't know. I don't, but you can imagine the creator did something that nobody else could do, all right? Really, it's, it's probably hard as a diamond, all right? Uh, divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and years. So the calendar really was started by these lights. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven. You give light up on the earth, and it was so. So the reason why Satan would deceive us and make us think that this earth is not bigger than the sun and the moon, that we're flying through outer space so many while miles per hour at high speeds, it's because he wants you to doubt what Yah did in the creation. He wants you to doubt the word. If you doubt what Yah did right here in Genesis 1, you can doubt the rest of it. All right? He went basically a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Now, today is the first day of unleavened bread, all right? Which uh, we eat this unleavened bread just like Israel ate for seven days of unleavened bread. From the, from the Passover to the last day, which is the 21st of Abib. Abib is how you say Abib. 
paleo vegan. All right? But he wants to leaven your unleavened bread with lies. All right? Say so he wants to leaven your unleavened bread. A little leaven, leaven is the whole lump the scripture says. So he can basically put doubts and the to doubts. He can make you doubt. The Bible can cause you to doubt. The Bible is the truth. But if he can make you doubt that truth, he's put a little leaven in your leaven. You're unleavened bread. And now you're unleavened. Now you're leaven. You're not unleavened, you're leaven. All right. But I believe the whole thing. I'm gonna be honest with you. Right here when I'm reading, it shows that the earth is bigger than the sun and the moon. And the sun and the moon is in the firmament that's in the second heaven. It's not in some third or some heck of a degree heaven away millions and billions of miles away. All right. I would I would I would basically say that, that the sun and the moon ain't even a hundred miles from the earth. Both of them. And they're inside of the firmament. They ain't even a hundred miles from the earth. All right. I, now you can study that on your own for you scientists out there. Study how far the firmament is above the earth. And there's somebody that measured it. I saw a video where they shot a rocket up there. And basically a rocket was a high speed rocket. But uh with a video camera on it. And it got so far up there and stopped. It hit something and stopped. You can see all the way down from where the rocket was shot at, or you can see the area, all right? But it stopped. Then it just went boom, like it hit something and stopped. Didn't go no further, all right? So I don't know how far that rocket was going. It was going at high speed, but it got stopped by something. And I, I can tell you what I believe it got stopped by. It got stopped by the firmament. That, that visible arch that's in the sky that we just saw in the screen. The, the uh, paleo Hebrew word for permanent. All right. But anyway, so you can see right off the top that how you create the heaven and earth, and it is the truth. All right. Like I said, that these stars is how we know the holy days. Now, I heard somebody the other day saying that they don't believe that there's 13 months in the Hebrew calendar. Some some years and not the other years. The fact that some people are doing the uh, Passover on April the twenty fourth instead of March the twenty third shows you that somebody did the thirteenth month. Okay, somebody's doing the thirteenth month, and the thirteenth month on the Hebrew calendar is correct. Some years the 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 nature tells you they had a thirteenth month. I forgot what that month is called. There's a name for it. The 12th month, there's a name for it. You have a 13th month. It's that name, plus they put a two right beside it. You know? So, so that the 13th month, some, some, some years. But we did the, we did the, the uh, March 23rd Shabbat uh, Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I could tell just by looking at the, the nature that is correct. I can tell just by nature is correct. Now, the reason why the Jews, the Karaite Jews over there in Israel, probably wouldn't do a 12th month this year and added a 13th, probably because the barley, what normally they do, they check the barley. If the barley ain't ripe at the end of the month, the 12th month, they add a 13th. All right? They had a 13th month. But on our calendar, the one I was doing with WLC, and I believe it, basically that it's, we, we didn't do that. We went 12 months in the last castle. In the last of these, we just added, we went 12 months. All right? Now, this is where you need the Holy Spirit at when you're trying to decide something. I'm going to tell you the reason why. Israel could be wrong over there on that April the 24th Passover. I'm going to tell you the reason why. Because the nature isn't normal over there. That means that some man could, man could dictate nature and say, well, we're going to cause through our heart 
or whatever uh, technology is going to cause the, uh, the, the the nature, the, the the clouds to drop down moisture at a certain time to where we have to add a 13 minute. Man can control that, believe it or not. But God will tell you so when something's wrong. And it, you can tell something's wrong because the horns, whenever the horns up on the moon, when your sliver of the moon comes in, you know, because they do the crescent moon as the, as the new moon. Your crescent moon is up under the moon. And so like the moon is smiling. That's how you know it's a, it's a, it's a new year. But you normally see the, the crescent and the barley all of that come around at the same time. This year, you have the you have the crescent moon up under the up under the moon, all right. It's a crescent up under the moon, like a smile. But then they're saying that the barley is not right, so something is wrong. But it's not that's not odd because we're coming around the time that tomorrow, on uh, April the twenty, excuse me, March the twenty fifth. Uh, there's going to be another uh, eclipse. There's going to be an eclipse tomorrow on the 25th, March the 25th, along with the April the 8th that's coming around real soon. This March 25th eclipse is going to, is going to be the eclipse that causes the top, that olive, the olive letter. All right? It's causing the olive and the tie. And the tie is going to be on April the 8th, but the one that's happening tomorrow is going to be what's called the olive. So when Yahweh Shai says, I'm the Alpha and the Mega, he's really in the Hebrew. Saying, but he didn't speak really Greek. That was not his. That was not his. His uh, his cultural language. He spoke Hebrew. What he really said when he said Alpha and Omega in the, in the Greek, he said I am the Olive and the Tau. So not only is Yah forming a Tau over America, which means the end of four hundred, with the number the the number in four hundred, is Tau in Hebrew equals four hundred. But he's also He's also forming from the the last eclipse, last eclipse uh, in 2017. He's forming a, an olive, which is the first letter of the Hebrew al alphabet. The alphabet which starts with olive. It's an A sound in Paleo Hebrew. Ah, not an A sound, but an A ah sound. So olive, bot. It's kind of similar to uh, to our like our our alphabet but it's a little different all right there's no i don't think there's a c right there at the bottom i haven't studied it that's, that's not my major study my major study is to get a good sense of the word when god says it's time to learn to for me to give you your, your original language you ain't gonna have to teach me you're gonna turn to us a pure language just all of a sudden miraculous just like he gave the the, the hebrew the disciples Tongues of Pentecost, that book of Acts, chapter two. Someone give us our Hebrew language back, just like that. All right, someone give us it back quick. Just like he, uh, at the Tower of Babel, gave everybody a different language. Well, in the, in the future, when he, when he restores Israel, he's going to give us our language back. You're not going to have to learn it. You're going to speak it without learning. Just like Adam was created, and he was created speaking, guess what? Paleo Hebrew. All right. The whole world was speaking Paleo Hebrew at the Tower of Babel when they when they got up the ark, Noah and his sons, they were speaking Paleo Hebrew. All right. But anyway, like I said, we we observed Passover yesterday, and it's kind of odd. All right, because the horns were up under the moon, but everybody else, not everybody, but most there was a lot of big time observers observing. Passover, April the 20 something. Something's wrong with that, all right? That means somebody's wrong, somebody's off. And this is where the Holy, like I said, this is where the Holy Spirit comes at. Because I thought about that. I said, should we basically turn around and observe the next Passover? It's a real Passover. And the Spirit spoke to me a couple of times, said no. All right? Now, a lot of people don't believe that there's a such thing as a baptism of the Holy Spirit in which the Holy Spirit can lead you to all truth. All right? They don't believe that. Like what I've been talking about. I had a, hell, I had a heck of an experience. 
the Holy Spirit. And he really just like, it was radical, just like Pentecost, chapter, uh, Acts chapter 2. My Holy Spirit experience was radical like that. All right? And all my life since then, since the age of 20, all right, I got the manifestation of a supernatural spirit. And that's how I found that I was a Hebrew. Because of the Holy Spirit speaking to me. At first, when the Holy Spirit was speaking to me, when I, before I got filled with the Holy Spirit, all right, I was wondering if I was seeing, hearing things or what was going on. I didn't even realize I was born again, but I had, I had accepted Mashiach in my life through a person that evangelized me. And after that, I started hearing things. Not only hearing things, seeing things. All right? And it all came to pass that it was Yahweh. But when I when I ask you how should I just go ahead on and and just follow the European Jews, he said no. Basically, he said you're feeling it right, you got it correct. All right. And I'm gonna be honest with you, it does feel like the beginning of the year. All right. For those that's doing uh, Passover, April twenty fourth. Um, the beginning of the year is going on uh, somewhere at the end of March, I think. There, there are five or a D. It's going to be at the end of March. Okay, of this year, 2024. All right. Within two weeks, it's going to be the beginning of the year. All right. How are they doing it on April 24th? I don't know. I haven't studied that. I don't study everything. Some things I just leave alone. But uh, but when you when you when you get the new moon correct, you count from there ten days. You go and get a land. That's what they did according to the scriptures in Gen uh, Exodus chapter twelve. They would go and get a lamb, his family, right, and, and then that would be on the tenth day of that that month, which is the beginning of the month beginning of the year is really spring. Spring in the Hebrew culture is the beginning of the year. It makes sense. It's the beginning of life. Life on the earth. All right? Plants and all of that. All right? It's called a, a Bible or a Bib. It's called the new. That's what it's called. That's what it, that's what it breaks down to, the new. So the newness of the year is in the, it's in, it's in the spring. All right? But uh, after the 10 days, you get your lamb. On the 14th day, which is four days later in the evening, you basically kill the lamb. Lamb without spot of blemish, hopefully. The whole congregation kills the lamb. And uh, I guess you would skin it. If you, oh, so I've never done this before, but you would skin it because you're not going to eat the fur on it. You're not going to eat the wool. That would not be tasty. All right, and you were roasted in that evening. You were roasted, and at that night you would eat it. After you put the blood on the doorpost of your house, all right. After you put the blood on the doorpost of your house of that same lamb, you would eat it. You would eat it. You would eat it in haste because it's, that was your house Passover, and that Yahweh was here to deliver Israel out of Egypt quickly. It's going to cause Pharaoh to, to spell him out of that quickly. And he's playing with Yah. After he killed everybody's firstborn child and even the firstborn of the animal, they heard from the rest of my father there. Take you and your animals, your wife, children, get out of here. And bless me too, is what he said. <laughs> it's, just, it's kind of funny. After he saw Yah put it, he put it down. That means Yah was playing with him all along. He said, well, all right, I hardened his heart. Now, when I do this one, you're going you're gonna to thrust y'all out of here quickly. He thrust Israel out of there, too. All right? He got him out of there by night. What shows you, I'm going to tell you something. I'll tell you something. That if the, if the calendar that most people observe has the next day, which is the Sabbath day, the next day, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, our convocation, if, this, if that was a Sabbath day, it started in the evening of the previous day. You know that they was working and they were walking. They was they was 
They were breaking that Shabbat day. All right. Why? Because they were stressed out of there and that whole night would be a Shabbat. But it showed you there's something wrong with that belief. I'm, you know, that's why I said observe Yahweh's word and Yahweh's word will teach you the calendar. Night is not day in Yahweh's word. When it says observe the Sabbath day, it didn't, it didn't say to observe the Sabbath, Sabbath night. Observe the Sabbath day. All right, Genesis 1.13, press on that word for day, 31.17. You're right there. You're right there. Yeah, right there. Yom. All right, yom is, the, yom is the word for day in Hebrew. Paleo Hebrew. It's got Y-O-M-E, yom. But in Paleo Hebrew, it's really yom because it's an A. Most of Paleo words, Paleo Hebrew words have an A in it. Awesome. That's why I said they don't have any. They don't have any vowels. But most of most of the paleo words have an ah sound. In them. That's the reason why you come up with Yahweh. All right. That's the that's the name of Yah. You get the one that they most people call Yahweh or Yahuwah. It has. They don't have a U. They don't have an A uh, sound in it, or like an E sound. It has an ah sound. And the only other only other vowel sound that it has is the I, which is the I N. All right. Only other vowel sound it has is the I N sound. That's the one you can come up with Yahweh Shai. Shai at the end of Yahweh Shai. At the end of Yahweh is the son's name, Yahweh Shai. So you had the I in there, you had the I in the same name, Yahweh Shai. All right. But the U and the O sound, Paleo Hebrew didn't have those sounds in the language. Now, modern Hebrew added vowel points and all of these vowels in it, and it's, it's not the same, all right? The Yam means, meaning it means to be hot, because it's not night, all right? Day is not night in Hebrew. It separated the day from the night, the light from the, from the darkness. A day as the warm hours. Yeah, how much I said that in some in one of the scriptures. He said, Is there not 12 hours yet in a day? When I first read that, I said, No, that's 24 hours in a day. You know, but I wasn't looking at it the way he was seeing it from the Hebrew point of view. Hebrew point of view is, is that there's 12 hours in a day. He's not talking about what's in the nighttime, he's talking about the daytime. And the Hebrew mind, night is for this for for relaxing, sleeping, until the day, all right? He that walks in darkness does not, does not know what she stumbles, it says. So basically, when you observe the Sabbath, you're observing the Sabbath day, warm hours. Having many hours is in the day, warm hours, that's, that's the Sabbath. When it, when, it, when it gets dark, night outside, there's no more Sabbath, Sabbath. Go ahead, let it in. When it gets when it gets warm, when it gets dark outside, that means Lila. It's two words for for evening and night. Evening is Arab. That means the sun is going down over the horizon, but it's still light in the sky. It's still light out. That's called the evening. The word for evening is Arab. All right. Then there's another word for darkness when it's totally dark, like midnight. It's called Lila. All right. When it's lila outside, that's no, that's no longer day. All right, people in the ancient times did not work at lila. They did not work at midnight, Except, unless you were a priest in the temple or something like that. That's a whole other story. So your Sabbath is on the day side of the day. So for those that believe that the day started in the evening, I can see why they believe that, but I don't believe it like that with them. For those that believe that the day started in the evening, when Pharaoh cast out Israel out of out of Egypt at night, at midnight, and that midnight, if it was if it was a Shabbat, they should not have been walking and all of that stuff. They should not have been working, cooking, bread, unleavened bread, when they when they got to what is it, Soko for Ramses, 
when they got to the to their destination at night, it should not have been working. It should not have even been walking. The reason why y'all allow Pharaoh to kick them out of there at night is because the nighttime ain't the Shabbat. That means they gave them enough time to get to where they were going so they could relax on the Shabbat. The first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Go, let's say, go to uh, Exodus chapter 12. Uh, chapter, yeah, Exodus 12. Nope. Go up. Right. Nope. Go down. Right there. Yeah, you're right on it. Go to 12. Right there. Scroll down. Go down. Okay. And it came to pass, Exodus chapter 12, verse 29. Scroll up a little bit more. Okay, that's good. And it came to pass that at midnight, Yahweh smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in his dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle, even the animals died. Now, I saw, uh, what is it, History Channel uh, documentary on this and what happened. You know, we see on the Ten Commandments with Moses, Charles, and Hesse, we see the, that Pharaoh, supposedly, which was your Brennan Brennan, the role of Pharaoh, had a son with a with one of those braids coming out of his head, bald head all over itself with a little braid. All right. <laughs> he had an eight, nine, ten year old kid. But really, this, 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 this firstborn that sat on Pharaoh's throne was somewhere in his 30s. And the, the people in the history channel did a basically a search. They found that Pharaoh. They found his body. And not too far away from Pharaoh's tomb, his, his, his uh, coffin, that was buried in the dust of, of the earth. It was basically Pharaoh's son, was he didn't have a good burial. All right? They found a skull because how they knew it was Pharaoh's son because he had the same genetics as the mummy. All right? And the, the skull was somewhere in his 30s. Pharaoh's son sat on his throne. So one, the first person that died, one of the first persons that died was Pharaoh's son. And that son was no eight or nine year old kid like in the movie, uh, Ten Commandments, starring Charleston Heston. That, that, that man that was the one, the child that died was not eight or nine years old, he was in his 30s. Likewise, uh, he do another disfavor, the story, telling the story of uh, the Bible. The Abraham, when he offered his son, Abraham, when he offered his son Isaac on the altar for Yahweh to obey him, they normally would show Abraham with an eight or nine, two year old kid, a 12 year old kid, a son. All right. But really, if you look at the time period when Abraham was around 30, 130 something years old, that's when Yah told him to do that. He basically fathered Isaac when he was 100. Now count that. 30 more years, 30 some more years, and then he tells Abraham to offer his son. How old do you think Isaac was? He was 30 some years old. Let's do the math. All right? That's the reason why he could carry the wood up the hill for his father. So, so he was somewhere around the same age as Yahushai was or Jesus was when he basically gave, gave his life for the world, all right? And basically, a lot of people, have been, you know, when they, when, they, when they do these things with the scriptures, with the Bible, these Hollywood versions, go to show you that they can't believe that some 30-some-year-old man would volunteer to give his life for something that God told his father. That's even why they make him an eight or nine-year-old kid, like I said, he was clueless. But Isaac was not clueless. He was basically willing to sacrifice his life all right, and that's the reason why he inherited the promise. He was willing to sacrifice his life for his father, with, for what Yah had told his father. All right, if you ever wonder what Isaac did that was so spectacular, that's we carrying out the wood up the hill and was willing to be bound, that his father put the knife in. He knew what was going on. He wasn't in some coma. He wasn't in some fairy tale land. He wasn't an eight, nine year old kid. He was 30 something years old. All right, so let's go back to where we was at. All right, so the, the, let's see. From the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, scroll up a little bit. The firstborn captive that was in the dungeon, that means 
if you was in jail and you was one of the first, you was the firstborn of your father and mother, you was dead that night. Okay. Kind of feel sorry for those those jailbirds in the dungeon. They didn't have a chance to basically offer a lamb and put blood on the doorpost of their cell. All right. It's kind of sad. Kind of sounds funny a little bit, but they were Egyptian, most likely. All right. The Israelites were enslaved. They weren't in dungeons. That would be wasting money. All right. They even had the Israelites basically enslaved. All right. But they was blessed because they had the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they knew what to do. Put blood on the doorpost and eat that lamb that night. All right. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house, but there was not one dead. Every house of Egypt had one dead in there. All right, go ahead, scroll up a little bit more. And he called for Moses and Aaron, scroll up a little bit more. Aaron. Don't go up too far. Oh, boy. Go down. Go down. Scroll down. Nope, no, nope, the other way. Okay. Go back up a little bit. Go back up. Verse 31. Make sure 31 is way in the middle up there. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up, get you forth. That's good enough. Rise up, get you forth from among my people. He said, Rise up, get you forth from among my people. Ye and the children of Israel, go and serve Yahweh as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. <laughs> he knew right there that it was the one true God. He had already solved the, the bugs and the, those other those other uh, plagues. But this one cooked the, took the cake. It took the cake. Bless me also, <laughs> he said. <laughs> All right. Scroll up a little bit. Okay, verse 33. And the Egyptians were urging upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. But they said, we'd be all dead men. And, it, and the people took their dough, their dough before it was leavened. That's why this feast is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Their needing trolls being bound in their clothes. We had a lot of people, just like, you know, you have the, sun, the signal, the, the, the drawing of people running away from home when their kids, they have a stick. With a, with a handkerchief or something that got the items in it. And they carrying a stick with their items. Well, the people weren't carrying a stick. They just had their, they had their clothes with all their stuff bound up in it and slung over either their shoulder or on carriages. All right? That's how they did it. And they were walking out of there, believe it or not, they were walking out of there with some sharp clothes on, all right? Because they had borrowed from the Egyptians. They was coming out of there decked. But look, but like poppers, but they was decked, right? And the people took that that dough before it was leaven, the kneading trolls being bound in the, up in their clothes, up on their shoulders. So right here it says they had their stuff on their shoulders, all right. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels. There they go. They borrowed borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver, jewels of gold, and rings. They came out of their deck sharp. Sounds like a Hebrew Israelite, right? You know, you see him, and he might be poor, but he's driving a Lincoln Continental. He's driving a, a what is it called, a Lexus. Back when I was a kid, Lincoln Continentals was what the Lexus are today. A Cadillac, it's a field Cadillac. All right, they're driving the sharpest stuff around, but don't have any money. Wearing the sharpest clothes, but, but don't have money. But here we have Israel coming out of Egypt, decked and sharp with, with silver, gold, and with sharp raiment. But... They don't have any money. They just borrowed it, all right? Go ahead, scroll up a little bit. And Yahweh gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. You might look, what well, they lent it, you know, the borrower servant to the lender. If they lent, they'd give it back. That's wrong. Well, I think Yah is the one that told them to do that, all right? He told Moses to tell the people to do that. Because uh, basically, they had, they, Owe the people reparations for a hundred years of uh, of uh, slavery. A lot of people that don't read the scriptures that have to study and say they were really in Egypt for 30 years. That's false. 
you just find the right doc, find the right scripture. And this, somebody got a hold to it and they wanted to make it look like another people that were these people that came out of Egypt. But the people that we know of as, as Israelites today were the original Israelites. And they, this, this was fulfilled when they were in Egypt thousands of years ago. But you look at the uh, Septuagint. Look at the Septuagint that was written 300 years before Yahweh. And the scripture in Exodus chapter 12, verse 40 says that, uh, that the sojourning of the children of Israel was 430 years. They dwelt in the land of Egypt was 430 years. If you look in the, in the Septuagint, it says that dwelt in the land of Egypt and also in the land of Canaan. All right, so God counted from the time he made the covenant with Abraham to the time that they came out of Egypt 430 years later. Besides, they weren't in Egypt for 430 years. Just do the count, just do, just do the math. All right, do the math. They weren't in Egypt for 430 years. All right, because it tells you, you know, when it does Moses' genealogy, it tells you how many forefathers that he had that lived in Egypt. All right? It's only, what is it, one or two? Now, how in the world could those people be living one or two forefathers amount up to 430 years? All right? It don't make any sense. But I, you know, when you first read this, the King James Version and the European Version, and they have uh, the, the interpretators have messed up on it and basically gave you a false doctrine. You're not at fault for that, but you're at fault if you've been in this Bible for years, you still think Israel was in Egypt for 430 years. And they try to make it look like those people, the 400 years of affliction was fulfilled right there. But let me tell you something. Israel did not have a 400 years of affliction in, in, in Egypt. They weren't in Egypt for, for, for 215 years altogether. In which 100 years, 100 of those years was uh, slavery, was oppression, was affliction. And it's a, it's a partial fulfillment of what would happen in the latter days. So when you read the Bible, always know that there's going to be a partial fulfillment. All right, when you read prophecy, there's always a par partial fulfillment in the ancient times, partial fulfillment. That means that it's going to be partially fulfilled before it's ultimately fulfilled in the latter days. So the latter days is for the ultimate fulfillment of all prophecies that were made in the ancient times. So even Yahweh is a partial fulfillment, believe it or not. A lot of people say, no, he couldn't be a partial fulfillment. He's the ultimate fulfillment. No. Yahweh is a partial fulfillment. Who's the ultimate fulfillment? Yahweh. His father is the ultimate fulfillment. All right? You might be saying, oh, he's laughing. No. No. Yahweh Shai is even a partial fulfillment of Scripture. You know? The, now, the, the, the prophecies that, that did talk about him did point at him. But even he is not the ultimate fulfillment of Yahweh. The father is the ultimate fulfillment of Yahweh. I'm not going to, I'm not going to get on that too much right now. I'm, I'm going to come back to it a little later. Because Yahweh Shai, <clears throat> there's a word that I just found out. You know, in, in, uh, in, in the Latin language, they say that the Pope is the vicar of Christ. That means he is the fulfillment or he is the replacement of Christ on the earth. So he's the vicar. We know that that's kind of like antichrist stuff right there, right? But for one thing, Christ would not be a Roman. He's a Hebrew. Hebrews don't even look like the Romans, all right? Hebrews are people of color, all right? People of color. So they, they say the Pope is a vicar of Christ on earth, but there's another word called vice general, jura. And that word is also used for the Pope too, which means a vicar of Christ. That's probably where they got the word vicar. The vice gerent, which I got from WLC that's watching one of their videos, right? they did a pretty good job. Vice gerent is what Yahweh Shai is for Yahweh. All right? Yahweh Shai is a vice gerent. That means when 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 he rose up from the dead, you notice that Yahweh Shai said, All power in heaven and earth is given unto me. That means Yah put him, sit him in the, right on his right hand side and let him rule as if he was Yahweh. Yahweh Shai is not Yahweh. He's not Yahweh. But Yahweh let him rule as if he was Yahweh. How long? Until the Father comes. 
to, to the kingdom. So Yahweh, Yahweh Shai's kingdom is right now. He's the one that's running the whole world. He's basically allowing the wicked to do their thing until, until the kingdom comes. The kingdom is the kingdom is going to be of the Father. And I'm, I'm gonna get on that a little bit later. But with Yahweh Shai being vicegerent, that means he is Yahweh in place of Yahweh. All right, hold on, let me kind of shake it a little bit. Let me calm down a little bit. All right, so he's that's called vicegerent. I've always taught this, all right. But when I when I thought Yahweh Shai was Yahweh, I that was a good reason to teach it because it looked like Yahweh Shai was Yahweh. How did I find out? I'm gonna yeah, be straight up with you. I told this, told we spoke this before on video. I used to teach that Yahweh Shai was Yahweh. But one day I was sitting in my kitchen, looking at scripture and thinking about the the, the deity of Yahweh Shai, which is which which is not true, but it seemed to be true. And all of a sudden, I got a visit. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in. I got a Holy Spirit visit. He came down, and I didn't look at him, but I knew his presence was there. When he came down, he said, I am not Yahweh. When he said that, he opened up my mind, my understanding, to see it in the scripture quickly. And then I understood right off the top. I didn't have to go, I didn't have to study and find out. He just said it and it opened up my understanding. All right. That he said he was not Yahweh, so I was wrong all those years, even though that doctrine seemed to be so great for me, so pleasing. But when he said he was not Yahweh, he opened up my understanding, so it did. I didn't miss anything. It was not a disappointment. It just opened up my understanding that the Father is coming. Did he say that Yahweh Shai is coming? Yeah, he's coming. He's coming. The son of the father is coming. But the father is going to come first. The kingdom is going to be the father's kingdom. After he comes as the ancient of days, he's going to put down all those, all those thrones that's ruling over the world. And when he, after he does all of that, he's going to send for his son, which is at the right hand of the father in heaven. And the son is going to come in the clouds of glory with, with the holy angels. All right? And he's going to give all of that stuff that he just got the kingdom, the power he just get, got over the world, he's going to give that and let Yahweh Shai rule and reign in Israel over his people. But he's going to be right there too. He's going to be in the temple. Instead of an ark of a covenant, that's going to be the real father. He's going to be sitting in the temple on the throne. All right? So the father's coming. When it's talking about the father, his souls of his feet going to be in Jerusalem and the temple and all of that, that's not talking about Yahweh Shai. His soul to his view is going to be there too. Let's talk about the Father. Okay, let's go on. All right. The Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste, where they said we'd be all dead men. And the people took their dough before it was leavened, and the meat and drove being bound on their shoulders. All right, we just read that. And then the Yahweh gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent. So he lent to the to the Israelites, but the Yah is the one that caused that to happen. They owed them more than just that. They did years of service to Egypt. All right, scroll up a little bit. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramsey to Suffolk, about 600,000 on foot that were men besides children. A mixed multitude went up also with them in, in flocks and herds, and they been very much cattle. All right? So in the real Shabbat days, and a lot of people don't believe that the, that the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a Shabbat. They just think it's a holy day. The first day, let me tell you right here, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which comes after Passover, is a, the regular Shabbat, the weekly Shabbat, except it's a high Sabbath, all right? It's a high Shabbat. It's the regular Shabbat that happens every week in Hebrew, not a, not. Gregorian calendar style. And the Hebrew, which does, which keeps their calendar by the sun and the moon, that's a regular Shabbat. So basically, the regular Shabbat you do every week is the first day of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread and the last day of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. It's just two regular Shabbats, except they high days. As a matter of fact, 
you can tell that they're different because on those days you can cook. On the on the on the first day of the feast of eleven bread and the last day of the feast of the eleven bread, you can cook food. But on the regular Shabbats, outside of the feast, you don't you can't cook. You can't light a fire. All right. But a lot of people don't understand because they they got a, they got some calendars from Enoch, from Jubilees, from whoever else. All right, they got the calendars from different from different places. I studied the calendar with 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 the, with the scripture, not with a not with a, another book. I studied the calendar from the books of Moses, from Moses, as a matter of fact. But what did I get my calendar from? From Moses. Moses gave me my calendar. I studied it under Moses from the Torah, not from Jubilees and all those other books. And, or, or Enoch, I think another book is Enoch. They, some people get their calendar from Enoch. All right. If the book of Enoch was written around 200 years before Mashiach, the and there was, there was no book of Enoch until 200 years before Yahweh, then how would they know the calendar? All right. How would you know the calendar if it was written 200 years before Mashiach? All right. Moses is the one that gives us the calendar. So you can study the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and get the, catch on to the calendar. So basically, we had Feast of Passover last night. Yesterday was the 14th day of the month. All right? You don't wait until the sun goes down and it's in a whole other day. No, that's a night. It's not a day. It's night. <laughs> that's the reason why Israel can leave Egypt and walk. And, and, and cook some bread when they got there, and it and it was not, it was not a, it was not a sin. Now, sure, you can cook on this on the piece of unleavened bread, but they were walking, they were laboring, walking, getting out of Egypt. The reason why Yah bought them out at night because the nighttime is not the Shabbat. The day is the Shabbat. Twelve hours in the day, the day is the Shabbat. When it gets night, it's no longer the Shabbat. There's no nighttime Shabbat. Nighttime is for sleeping, right? It's for someone else. It's not working. You don't do work on the night in that in that culture. We never basically gave a law for what you do at nighttime on the Shabbat. You know, Shabbat night. Observe Shabbat night. You know what I'm saying? There's no Shabbat nights. It's Shabbat day, Sabbath day. All right? And then the next day, when the sun comes up, it's, it's the Shabbat. It's the first day, the first day, the first, not the first night, first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. All right, now we know that that word day can include the night. All right, because the night can be an all encompassing word for day and night. All right, but notice that he, he, Yah allows Pharaoh to cast him out of Egypt at night. Go there to uh, Deuteronomy 16. But it'll be still in the Torah. Deuteronomy 16. Right there. 16. Right there. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 16, 1. You see it says Passover right there on the top. Observe the month of Abide or B, according to modern Hebrew. I preserve the month of Abib and keep the Passover unto Yahweh thy Elohim. For in the month of Abib or Abib, Yahweh thy Elohim brought thee forth out of, out, out of Egypt by what? Night. Click on that word Hebrew 39, 50, 15. That word for night. It brought Israel out of Egypt by night. Lila, that's the word, Lila. All right. Means that means night, midnight. I gave you figure out of that. Notice that the word is not a rare, it's not by evening. He bought him out of Egypt, he bought him out by like, night. I used to have a friend, a buddy that I led to Yahweh Shah uh, years ago. He's very dark skinned, and guess what his nickname was? Midnight. You know, the only thing you can see from a distance sometimes that know that you know that was him, that his teeth were white. You know, that's midnight. How do you know? Because I see his teeth. 
<laughs> he's dark skinned, and they call him, he got a nickname, and it fits him. He's so dark, they call him Midnight. And you can see his teeth, his teeth is like the moon. All right. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, how about, it says, you how the Al Haim about being fortified of Egypt by night? So he used Pharaoh to bring him out of there by night. Yahweh and I used Pharaoh to cause him to break the commandment. So they 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 traveled by night till they got to their destination. When they got to their destination, they rested. All right? Because it was daytime. It was the, it was, it was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. First day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Day. But they rested. We don't have to go too much more into that. All right? But we know Pharaoh eventually changed his mind went after them, all right? But they were resting in the daytime of that, of that holy day. And they were by the, they were by the, they were, they were, how can I say it? They were entangled within the reef, the, the, the mountains area. So the mountains were, were wrecked, were, how can I put it? They were mountains that had only a little bit of space for people to walk through the mountain ridges, it was mountain range, mountain ridges. When they came out of the mountain ridge, they were on a beach, which is the Red Sea. Pharaoh said they caught up within the mountain range where they could not go to the right nor to the left. And he thought, well, it'd be easier to get them while they're in the mountain range. So they and his men went after them. By the time Pharaoh got there, they was at the beach area. They still, they still was caught with Pharaoh right there right there and they can cross the sea. You know, it's easy to get them all. Well, we know the story, y'all open up the Red Sea and all of Israel walk through the, through, the, through the sea on dry ground. Wow, there was a, a pillar of fire keeping Pharaoh's army away from them. You know the whole story. If you don't read that, it's in the scriptures. I'm not going to read it right now. But he brought Israel out of Egypt by night, which is not a Shabbat. That's why I say that people that say that the nighttime of every, of every day when it gets night, it's another day. I beg to differ. Just think of that. The nighttime in the, in the evening is another day. What did we just say about the day? The day and the night is different. <laughs> All right, let me say that again. The nighttime of each day is another day. Doesn't that confuse you? Now, the only time he tells us that, that, uh, that we should observe a day from the evening to the evening is the Feast of the Day of Atonement. See, in the Day of Atonement, you should keep your, your Sabbath from evening to evening. It's not even night to night. Evening to evening, it's a rare to a rare. All right? So basically, if they're going to do it like they do the Day of Atonement, it's the evening when the sun goes over the horizon, that, that's another day. So the Yah didn't mean for us to look at that scripture and and, and, uh, and dictate every Shabbat the same way, that from evening to evening is Shabbat. You know, it, it doesn't make any sense. All right. So when you study the calendar, study it from, from Moses. Moses gives you the truth about the calendar. All of the books are suspect. That means Enoch, uh, whoever else with the Jubilees, uh, what's the other one? Uh, there's another one that they got, Enoch, Jubilees. There's another book that a lot of people get their calendar from. All the other books, even the apocryphal books, are suspect to Moses. Moses teaches the calendar. He shows you what is the Shabbat. The Shabbat is not nighttime. And after the, after the, after the day, of, after the the Passover, the next day, it's the first day of, of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You don't wait a few days. It, that doesn't make any sense. So the Shabbat is from the from the fifteenth of every month of the of the of the month to the twenty second. We know that that the Shabbat on you know, every month is from is on the fifteenth on the twenty second every month. All right, it's the daylight hours of those days. So if the Shabbat is on the 15th and on the 22nd, we know seven days after the 22nd is what? 29th. That's the last Shabbat of that month. The next day or the next two days is going to be new moon. Now, the 15th is the Shabbat of every month. Then 
just seven days previous would be the eighth. The eighth day of the month is the Shabbat. You don't count the new moon as a, as a Shabbat, but it is a special day, like as if it is a Shabbat. That's the first day of the month. All right? So that's, that should be a hint. But the, the, the major hint is that the new moon is the dark moon. It's not a sliver, not a crescent moon. It's a crescent, it's not new. The crescent, the light been on the moon for a while. The new moon is when, this, when the first little bit of light gets on it, which definitely we cannot see. The fact that there's no light on the moon, basically when, they, when the light leaves the one side of the moon, it goes immediately to the other side, you just can't see it. So when there's a dark moon, it's a new moon. All right? When there's a dark moon, it means it's a new moon. And then all the moon phases are, are accurate. They're perfect. The first Shabbat is going to be a half moon. The second Shabbat is going to be a full moon. The third Shabbat is going to be a, guess what, half moon on the other side, wing. And the next Shabbat will be a crescent, waiting on the new moon. It's going to be a little light on the moon until it goes into new moon status. The next day, the 30th or the 31st, will be the, will be the, will be the beginning of the next month. I have to say the 30th, 31st you know, of the previous month. So it'll help you understand that a little bit better. But it's not the previous month, it's just the beginning of the next month. Sometimes it takes two days to get to the next month. All right? And how, how, was that in the scripture? Go we'll study David and Jonathan. When, uh, when that was a new moon day and Saul was waiting on David, David was not there. It was a two day new moon day. All right? It's right there in the Bible. All right? But anyway, but the Passover this year for us was yesterday. Today is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is our regular Shabbat, but it's a special Shabbat. Go to, uh, let's see, go to search, put in there a high setup, H-I-G-H, and then setup. Okay, go to John 19 to 31. So when Yahweh was crucified, they was looking for a place to bury him because it was getting dark. You no know, people don't work at nighttime and all of that. They were looking for a place to put him. So we know the story that they put him in the grave of Joseph of Arimathea. They gave him a, gave him a freshly carved tomb that he was going to use for himself. Nobody had ever laid in it. They used it for Yahweh all right, they put Yahweh in the tomb. All right, it says the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparations, John 19 31, it's not over again. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain up on the cross on the Shabbat, on the Sabbath day. What, what was the Sabbath day? It was not there, there was not the uh, it was not the Passover, it was not the Shabbat day. The next day was the Sabbath day. See that. So basically, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread was what? Sabbath day. Let me read it again. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the bodies should not remain up on the cross on the Sabbath day. For the Sabbath, let me read the rest of it. For the Sabbath, for that Sabbath day was a high day, was, a, was an high day. All right. So that Sabbath day was a high day. It's a Sabbath, it was a regular weekly Sabbath, but that Sabbath was a high day, which was basically, that's the day that you can cook on. You can celebrate. You not only eat that and bread, but you're cooking. On a regular Sabbath day, you don't cook. All right, so that Sabbath day was a high day. Notice that they call it the first day of the piece of unleavened bread, a Sabbath day. Notice that? They're not calling it the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They're calling it that Sabbath day. And it was a high day, which means that it was a, it was a holy day. Look at the press on that word for high day, 3173 in the Greek. It's um, verse 31, the, the, high, the white part of the scripture. Right there. Megas. 
So basically, it was a Megas day. Usually, the word Megas means a great day. Uh, let me see what, what the interpretation of it is. It means big and a very wide application. It means exceedingly great, high, large, loud, mighty, sore, afraid, strong, two years. It's a mega day, mega day. So they just took out of that. So let me read it again. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the, on the cross. Preparation for that, for what? Look at the preparation. Go up there at the word preparation, 3904. right there, all right? The word is paraskuye, parasmu, parasmue, parasmue. Like I said, I, I'm not uh, a fan of Greek language, but anyway, as if from 3903, readiness, preparation. So the, when they were prepared for the Sabbath was the previous day. So on Passover, it still was a preparation day for Shabbat. Go ahead, click out of there. All right, so let me start over again. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation, the preparation for the Shabbat, that the body should not remain upon the cross on that on the Shabbat day, which is the next day, the Shabbat day. But that Shabbat day, that Sabbath day, was a high day. They saw Pilate that their legs should be broken that they might be taken away. All right? Now, was it the Shabbat day began at, at, at night or on the next day? The Shabbat day did not, does not begin at night. Otherwise, it would not be called a day. It'd be called a Shabbat night. All right. Let me go ahead and continue to read. It's kind of funny. Then came the soldiers to, to break the leg of the first and the other, and the, which was crucified with him. But when they came to Yahawashai and saw that he was dead already, they break not his leg. And one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side. Forthwith came there out blood and water. Now, look at the word dead already. Let's see if there's something on that. Because really, when you're dead, water does not gush out of your body. All right. Look at the word for dead. On verse 33. Read 23 to 48. Nay school. The nay school. The is the word for dead. Was dead. Uh, means to die literally or figuratively, to be dead, to die. Literally or figuratively, I think it's played a part in this. That when a person's heart is still beating, when you stab them, blood pours out. That means that they, how do how they say that word? They, uh, when people are dying and they, blood is coming out of their body, what, how do they, what's, what's the term for that? See, they see it today. When, when people are dying, the blood is pouring out of their body. So you have to stop the blood if you want to keep the person alive. Because the, the heart is still beating. Well, right here, you can click out of that. You can click out of that. Yahweh Shai is basically was pouring blood out of his body. But the scripture said he was dead already. So that literally and figuratively comes into play. That means he was out of it. But his, but his body was still alive. But he was gone. All right, he had let his head down, he was gone. His body was still beating, and then when he stabbed him, it out came pouring out blood and water. It was stabbing in the heart, so that means that whatever the heart was doing, it was pumping out, it was pumping blood still in his body. It started pumping it out, the blood came out of the body. Out, and it says, it, uh, but when they came to Yahawashai, saw that he was dead already, they break not his leg, but one of the soldiers with a spear. Pierced his side, forth came there out, blood and water. So you do science, you look at that scientifically, when a person's dead, their heart starts beating, you stab them, they ain't gonna pour out blood and water. Okay, well, unless the heart is still beating. Okay. If he had saw that for their record, his record is true. And you know if that his that he said true, that you might believe. These things were done and done that the scriptures that the scriptures should be fulfilled. The bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture said they look they shall look upon him whom they have pierced, whom they pierced. All right. 
So right there is telling us that Yahweh Shai died on Passover. The next day was the Sabbath day. That Sabbath day was the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So basically, that even identifies and confirms it's the, the calendar. But the fifth, the fourteenth day of the of, a, of Abide was Passover. The fifteenth is the Shabbat day. The fifteenth of every month on the Hebrew calendar is a Shabbat. That fifteenth of every month on the calendar is a full moon. I know I see some Hebrew brothers. They, you know, all of us are trying to get it right. I didn't have it right at the beginning myself, but I see some Hebrew brothers that's doing the dark moon as uh, as the as the the full moon. The, what should be called the new moon, they call them at the full moon. <laughs> And they call them the, the they call them the, the full moon, the new moon. The full moon is the new moon. It's backwards, you know what I'm saying? But I'm not gonna try to make fun of people, put them down. I was messed up too for a while. But the full moon is the moon that shows up on the on the Shabbat every 15th day of the Hebrew calendar. The dark moon is a new moon because it starts its phases all over again. It's the new moon, just like when a person, when a woman gets pregnant, you don't see, you don't see a baby. You don't see a big baby in her stomach. You don't see a watermelon in her stomach. You, you look at her, you, you only thing you can know, you can tell that she's pregnant. She's throwing up. And she has morning sicknesses and stuff like that. And then later on, you see, hey, she's, that stomach is starting to get a little full there. And later on, at the end of her time period, you see that she's carrying a watermelon in her stomach. Okay, but uh, so, uh, new moon is like that. The new moon starts out where you cannot see the light on the moon. That's a new moon. That's how you get the perfect phases. Half moon is first is the first Shabbat. Full moon second Shabbat. Half moon third Shabbat, and the sliver, which is getting ready to go into the new moon again, is the fourth Shabbat. Every month should have four Shabbats. And you look at some people's calendars that are basically are wrong, including the people that's over there that's in the Holy Land today. They will have a Shabbat, like the Passover on one day, right? And the next day is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, all right? There'll be another regular day after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then the Shabbat, the weekly Shabbat. <laughs> All of a sudden, after the, oh my goodness, Yah is not that sporadic, all right? He's very, very even and neat. The Shabbat day is what basically all his holy days are on. All the holy days are on the Shabbat, except a few. There's a couple days that are not on Shabbats that are holy, all right? Like the, uh, on the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar called Tishri. Called the, uh, the feast of feast of trumpets. That's on the new moon. It's not on the Shabbat. It's on the new moon. Uh, nine days later, is the day of atonement. Nine from the ninth day of the of Tishri to the tenth day of Tishri, and you start those days. You start the ninth day at evening. The tenth day of, to the tenth day at evening. It's called the day of atonement. That's not on the Shabbat day. So there's a couple of days that's not on the Shabbat that are holy days, all right? But most of the Yah's holy days are on Shabbats, all right? The one that we're doing right now, that's where well, yesterday was the Passover and today is the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's called a Kog, a Kog, a Hog, Kog. And there's another one in the seventh month of the year called the, called the, the Feast of Booths. And then the first day of the Feast of Booths is on the 15th of the month. The last day is on the 22nd of the month. And then some people, they have, a, they have a festival called the 23rd of the month. It's called the, the Feast of Sona has something to do with water. All right? Yahweh Shai and the scriptures is at that feast. And he told people, come unto him, come unto him and get water to drink if you're thirsty. That was on the 23rd of the Feast of Booths. All right, but all of those days are really you can tell Yah is very neat and orderly. You know, Shabbat is Shabbat. You only have one Shabbat every week. 
you don't have two or three, four Shabbats a week. All right? So that, that day was a Sabbath day right there in the book of John. John 19.31. The next day at the Passover was a Sabbath day. It was a high Sabbath day, but it was a regular weekly Sabbath. What week what day? It was the 15th day, which is a full moon, the first day after Passover. It was a regular Shabbat day, but it's a high Shabbat because it was the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So I'm, I'm tired of speaking on that. All right? But uh, where we are. So, but my major thing I want to talk on, we talked about the day of Feast of Passover, is that uh, we got we got uh, we my cell phone. We got a um, Tomorrow, on the 25th of March, it's going to be an uh, eclipse. It's not going all the way across America. It's going halfway across America. But when you look at what the eclipse that happened in 2017, with the one, and also the one that's going to be taking place on April the 8th this year, it forms a olive, and the, the other one that's on the 8th forms a tau. So basically, in the Hebrew, Yahweh Shai said he's the, olive, he's the olive and the tau. In the Greek, he says, I'm the alpha and the mega. So Yah not only got a tab across the country through these eclipses, through the same eclipses, he's got an olive or uh, uh, what is it called? Alpha in the Greek. He's the Alpha and the Mega, he's the olive and the tie in the, in the Hebrew. So what is he saying? It has something to do with him, you're the judge probably. Now remember we said that according to the dictionary, the, the language, that he's a vice jurist. Ger Vicegerent of Yahweh, all right, and which I think you know I've been teaching this for years, well for the last few years since Yahweh revealed that to me. And he's a vicegerent. That means Yah gave him. Turn to Matthew, Matthew twenty-eight. So when Yahweh rose him up from the dead, he gave him all power. There's a song that I grew up listening to because my father was a preacher, was an evangelist. And I think it was the Alabama Blind, blind Boys for the Matthew 28. That's John. No, oh, go down, scroll down. Right there. What is it right here? Right there. 28. My father had his hi fi stereo when he was kids, 1969, 70. All right. And he'd come home and he listened to most of his, his spiritual, we call them spirituals. And one of the songs that came on was okay, it was decent. And the name of the song was Jesus Rose with All Power in His Hand. Now, what's wrong about the timing? It says he died on Friday evening and rose on Sunday morning. But the, the major thing is that, that they said it was true. He rose with all power in his hand. Scroll down. So when he rose, Yah gave him all power. So if he had all power, that means he had the Father's power. All right, scroll, can you scroll down a little bit more? Or is that it? Okay, Matthew 28, it says, he told his disciples, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. Oh, I started too late. Matthew 28, 18, Yahweh Shai came and spake unto them, saying, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. That's how I said. All power. Go to that word power, Greek 1849. So Yahweh Shai has all power, even right now, in his hand. Azuzia, all right? In a sense of ability, privilege, that is, force, capacity, com com competency, freedom, mastery, magistrate, superhuman, potentate, token of control, delegated, influence, authority, jurisdiction, liberty, power. Now, I'm normally talking about the father. But here we're talking about the son now. What does what does the son get? He got all power. Was, was this something that he had before? No. He got this power from becoming the sacrifice for mankind on earth. So for for mankind's sake, Yahweh exalted him above all. Go to Philippians, Philippians chapter two. For mankind's sake, Yahweh exalted him above above all. All right, Philippians. Going a little further down, Philippians 
Let's start with the pH right there. Go to chapter two. Start around verse five. And it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, or Mashiach Yahweh Shai, who being in the form of God. Now, what was Yahweh Shai before he was God? Before Yahweh gave him all power? He was in the form of God. And people say he didn't look like God. I think the difference. It says he was in the form. Go to 34, 44. Greek 44, 34, 44. Look against 2 6. He's right there. He's right there. Well, we get close, right there. Morphe is for the word form. All right? The idea, the, the, the idea of adjustments of parts, shape, particularly nature, form. So Yahweh Shai looks like the Father. He's in the form of God. Go ahead, click out of that. Who being in the form of God. So Yahweh Shai was in the form of God. Thought it not a robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Scroll up a little bit. Just a little bit. Okay, you can start right there. Verse 7 says he's made in the likeness of men. Remember, he was created before anything else, and Yah used him to create everything else. All right? Verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. <laughs> Excuse me. Wherefore God, wherefore, let me say that again, wherefore God all, also has highly exalted him, giving him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Yahweh Shai, every knee shall bow, of things in heaven, and of, you know, things in earth, and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Yahweh Shai Mashiach is Adon, to the glory of God the Father. So basically what Yahweh Shai is right now in heaven, he is a vicegerent, not a vice. The word is vicegerent. Let me see if I can spell it out for you. Got it right here. V-I-C-E-G-E-R-E-N-T. V-I-C-E-G-E-R-E-N-T. Vicegerent. All right? So he's a vicegerent of Yahweh. So Yahweh exalted him. So what did Yahweh go to? If Yahweh set him on his right hand and gave him all power and made him live and have authority like as if he was Yahweh, what did Yahweh go to? All right? That's what I've been talking about lately. First thing I talk about is Yahweh. But what did Yahweh go to? Well, there's something going on there. All right? Something going on there. All right? That means Yahweh took his life I'm going to be honest with you. It's like he took a vacation. He's like, oh, now I can sit back and relax. I don't have to run everything in the world any longer and all the, you know, all authority and all of that. I can give it to somebody else and relax. It's kind of like that a little bit. But really, Yahweh don't have to do that. Running everything is nothing for him. The heavens and the earth cannot contain. So what did he do? Well, it's obvious that Yahweh is planning on coming down here. Go back to Matthew 28. Start at verse, you should leave it right there. At the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. All right, now I want to say that the, at, the, at the end of the Sabbath, that's another thing, just like 430 years in captivity, that basically somebody put in there to confuse up some folks. All right. Basically, after the after the, the day of atonement, excuse me, not the day of atonement, after the Passover and then the feast of unleavened bread happens, and you start counting, start counting toward the day, uh, what is it, feast of unleavened bread? All right, you start counting toward that day. And there's so many Shabbats, you got to count, what is it, seven Sabbaths? And then after seven Sabbaths, you add 50 days to the count. Right? Harvest. What's that? Harvest. Feast of Weed Harvest. Yeah. Feast of Weed Harvest, which is Pentecost. So that's how you count to the Feast of Weed Harvest. The first, after Passover, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you count seven Sabbaths. 
after the seven Sabbaths, you don't count one day and escape them. That's it. They count. They did that wrong too. After the seven Sabbaths, you count. You count seven Sabbaths, which is forty nine, which is forty nine days. If you count, you start with the next Sabbath. All right. So you have to wait till the next Sabbath. And that'll be that'll be Sabbath one. When you get to the seven Sabbaths, you add fifty days. After counting seven Sabbaths, after the the, the feast of unleavened bread, Shabbat. Then you basically add 50 days. That's how you get to your feast of wheat harvest. Wheat does not grow in May. You don't get wheat harvest in May. You get wheat harvest around the end of summer. So the seven Sabbaths after the, the uh, after the day uh, 11 bread starts, the seven Sabbaths you start for the first Sabbath after the 11 bread. That'll be the first one of seven. You get to the seven Sabbath, you have 50 days. Okay, that's how you count that. When you get to the 50, 50th day, that's a piece of wheat harvest or a pinnacle. Okay. But what does what is, what is Yahweh go after? He gives Yahweh Shai his authority, all his power. Well, do me a favor, go to John chapter 3. And there's a that's Acts. That's Luke. In between Acts and Luke, you got John right there. So it's a mystery. There's in Revelation chapter 10, there's a, there's a such thing as a mystery of God. What is the mystery of God? The mystery of God is this, that God is coming down here. God is coming down here without burning up everything. All right, because if you come down here like he did after he brought Israel out of Egypt, and like he come down on Mount Sinai, it's like he'd burn up some stuff. That mountain up there, what is it, Mount Sinai, is still burning at the top. But this time he's coming down as a human, regular human being where people can see him. So really the reason why, he, it looks like the reason why he left Yahweh Shai with all power because Yahweh is making a descent. I said it correctly, a descent. All right, scroll up a little bit. Okay, right there. John chapter three, verse 13, no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the son of man which is in heaven. Now, I wanna read that again. No man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the son of man which is in heaven. All right. You know, Yahweh I said he does nothing but what he sees the Father do. So whatever you see Yahweh I do, guess what? The Father has done it or is going to do it. All right. The Father's have done it or is going to do it. When he's talking about right here, no one has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven. Press on that word, he that came down from heaven, which is Greek 2597. That's you uh, right there, right there. Catabino, cata, 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 bay. Oh my goodness, my, my Greek is not good. Catabino, cata, cata, I'm gonna just say catabino. Okay, all right. That word means it means it means to descend. To descend, literally a figure to come. Get those step down, the sin, fall down, come down. We saw that Yahweh descended on Mount Sinai when he brought Israel out of Egypt. So there's going to be another time that Yahweh descends. He's going to descend down for the latter day. Is he going to descend down at the latter day? Well, let's put it this way. He's going to descend down for the latter day. I think he, he started his descent when Yahweh Shai rose up from the dead. You see the angel of Yahweh descend down. Uh, go to Matthew chapter 28 again. There it is right there. Matthew 28 verse 1. In the end of the Shabbat, as it began to dawn until the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a greater earthquake. 
just like the six seal in, in, in Revelation chapter 6, it is a great, great earthquake. But the angel of Yahweh descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone from the door of the set upon it. His countenance kind of was like lightning, his raiment was white as snow. Now, what's the angel of Yahweh doing with a raiment white as snow? You, you see in Revelation chapter 7 that the people that have raiment that's white with palm branches in their hands before the throne, saying, uh, Salvation to our God that sit upon the throne and also unto the Lamb. And when, they, when they, one of the elders asked John, What it is what are these people that's arrayed in white? He, he had eventually told them that they, the reason why they're arrayed in white is because they have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. All right? If that's the reason why people are wearing white raiment, it's because of the blood of the Lamb. Why, why is this angel wearing right, white? The angel's not human. He's not a part of the redemption story, or is he? All right? His countenance was like lightning. His raiment was white as snow. And the key word is that he descended. Now, behold, there was a great earthquake and the angel of Yahweh. But the angel of Yahweh descended from heaven. Came and rolled back the stone and set the door and set upon. Look at that word descended, 2597. Remember, he said, No man has ascended to heaven, but he the first descended. Right there. Catabino, the descend, literally a figure, a figure pick out of it. So the angel, go to Daniel chapter 7. Remember that angel right there is wearing white. He has a white, white as snow. Raymond white as snow, which means that he had some type of way been washed in the blood of the Lamb. So if he is as white as snow, the other people in Revelation chapter 7 just had white garments on. But this angel has a garment white as snow. I mean, he was really washed in the blood. So go to Daniel chapter 7. Let's scroll down a little bit. What have you got right there? 7. Up to 7. Scroll down to verse 9. Remember the four beasts that came out of the earth that, that represent the four kings that would rule over the earth to the latter days and to the ancient days came. I beheld to the throne were cast down and the ancient days did sit. His garment was white as snow. The key that you should notice right here is that the garment, just like that angel that rolled the stone away of Yahushua's tomb, had that angel had a garment white as snow. The Ancient of Days has a garment, well, guess what? White as snow. So what's going on? This is this is the this is the creature, this being, which is really God. We know he's God. This be this being who is really God is the one that takes out the fourth beast. The little horn. He takes him out, takes out all authorities over there. Not Yahweh, not him exactly. Technically, we can we can we can see where he does it technically. But the one that literally does it is this ancient of days, takes out the little horn, the beast, the fourth beast, the dragon. He has a garment on white as snow. What is he doing? What is Yahweh, God, doing with a garment white as snow? Let me tell you what I think it is, you know, for my studies. The angel of Yahweh, go to Exodus chapter 3. Angel of Yahweh here. Is representative of Yahweh. Okay, that's good right there. The angel of Yahweh appeared unto him, unto Moses, in the flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked and behold, that the bush burned with fire, the bush was not consumed. Moses said, Now I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not, is not burnt. And when Yahweh saw that he turned aside to see, to see God, Yah Allahim, called unto him out of the midst of the bush. So this, whoever this angel was, whatever this angel was, he was called Allah. Let me read it again. When Yahweh saw that he turned aside to see, Allah called unto him out of the midst of the bush. What was in the midst of the bush? The angel of Yahweh. All right? And said, Moses, Moses, he said, here I am, here I am, here, here am I. And he said, draw not nigh, hither, put out the shoes of thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. Verse 6, scroll up a little bit, just a tad bit. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father. You mean, wait a minute. 
This angel is telling Moses that he's the God of his father, Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. Moses hid his face where he was afraid to look at God. All right, the angel that's in the midst of the bush is saying that he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now we get a good picture of why this angel descended from heaven after Yahweh rose from the dead and rolled away the stone. He has a garment on white as snow. What is that telling us? Along with the ancient days in the book of Daniel, it has a garment on white as snow. What is that telling us? That, that that angel that descended, the angel that was in the bush that was burning, that said that he was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is Yahweh, the ancient of days. All right? He's the ancient of days. What happened there? Yahweh was in the process of lowering himself so he can come down and dwell with man. Well, Jesus already done that. He lowered it. No, Jesus was not the most high. Even Yahweh had come and visited me and told me that I'm not told me to say I'm not God. And I know that was him. This is the truth, because he proved it in the scripture. Now he's he's a vice jurid where Yah gave him all authority, put him in his place to reign. So when is Yahweh gonna reign too? It's gonna reign until the Father comes and the kingdom comes. So the kingdom that comes is the Father's kingdom. Where's Yahweh Shai at right now? He's reigning in the heavens. So his kingdom is right now. He's reigning. He's reigning over the world. All right? Now, is he the one causing all the evils and wickedness going on in the earth? No. But he's ruling over all of that. All right? He's ruling over all of that. Where's the father at? He's coming down. He's got a descent. Just like Yahweh Shai basically came down through many generations. The father's going to come down through many generations. All right? And when, he's, when he comes into the earth, he's going to be in captivity with his people. That means most likely he's going to be in Americas. Which country is y'all judging with a tie, with an olive and a tie sign? America, right? With olive and a tie sign. A sign. It's America, right? Guess what country you think the father is manifesting himself in? America. All right? So the Father's coming down to. So Yahweh, Yahweh Shai basically was a partial fulfillment of the Father. He's the Son, and he has all power in his hand for right now until the Father brings the kingdom. All right? He has all power in his hand, like the song said, Jesus rose with all power in his hand. He died on Friday evening, rose on Sunday morning. I want to sing it. But I want you to just hear the words of it. Jesus rose with all power in his hand. Dying on Friday evening and rose to the rising on Sunday morning is not correct. That is not three days and three nights. But that's what was given to us by our slave masters, right? Friday evening, Sunday morning, and it's Easter morning when he rose up. But what is correct, what they corrected, he rose up with all power in his hand. Matthew 28, verse, I think it starts at verse 18, where he told his disciples, all power has been given unto me in heaven and earth is what he said. So he's a vice gerent. He's vice gerent until the kingdom. When the kingdom comes, go to 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians. Scroll down more. Don't go past the gospels. Go down. Right, right there. 15. No, right there. Go down to verse 20 something. Went down too far. Go up a little bit more. Okay, right there. Go up just a little bit more. Okay, right there. First Corinthians 15, 24, then come at the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall put down all rule and all authority and all power. So he reigns, where does he reign at? Where he's reigning at right now. All right? But when he's finished, when that finish, when that finishes, he's gonna give the kingdom back to God. Where's, the, where's God gonna be at when he gives the kingdom back to him? It's gonna be in the earth. It's gonna be the ancient of days. All right. Well, he must reign until he has put all enemies on his feet. 
we, we right here is saying that Yahweh is going to do that himself. If he's reigning with all power in his hand, it looks like it's really him, but it's really the Father putting all enemies under Yahweh's foot, feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So when is this going to be? Is it going to be after the millennial reign? No. It's going to be before the millennial reign. Death, death will be defeated. Before the millennial reign, before Yahweh, before the thousand year reign of God on earth, death is going to be defeated. All right? So Yahweh has been reigning for 2,000 years up in heaven as Yahweh himself, like as if he was Yahweh, until the last enemy is destroyed, which is death. For he, verse 27, for he had put all things under his feet. And when he said, if all things are put under him, it's manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. So the Father is going to be accepted. But the Father, what's, what's the tendency for man to do? The tendency for man to do is to reject the Father. Now, one thing that they do, one thing I noticed, remember they came, they came by force to make Yahweh Shai king in the book of John? I think it's John. They came by force to try to make him king. What does that tell you? That he was not totally rejected. Even the chief priests in them said, what should we do? All of, Everybody, all men is going after me. What does that tell you? Yahweh Shai was not rejected totally. We see scriptures where it looks like he's rejected, but what is that talking about? Isaiah 53. That's talking about the father. The father is the one that's totally rejected. It took Yahweh Shai to basically make reconciliation between his, between Israel and the Father. But Israel rejected the Father. Israel committed adultery as a nation against the Father. But they really didn't hate the Son like that. All right? So it's the Father that has to be accepted. So let me read that again. For he had put all things under his feet. But when he said, if all things are put under him, it is manifest that he has accepted, which did put all things under him. When all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him in all things. Let me, I, I didn't read that right. When all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, which is, that is God, that God may be in all in all. So even though Yahweh shall reign in us, Yahweh in heaven, it's God, the Father, that put all things under his feet. When all things should be, when all things should, shall be subdued unto Yahweh Shai, and he's put all things, all these enemies under his feet, then shall he be subject to the Father. That's when he comes down from heaven, because then go to verse Daniel chapter 7 again. If I can go to history. Daniel chapter 7. Scroll down to verse. 13. And I saw in the night visions, this is Daniel. Daniel basically saw a lot of stuff that's really powerful. And I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days. And they brought him there before him. When I used to read this, and I used to think Yahweh Shai was God. I used to think this would happen in heaven. This was going on in heaven. All right? That they bought, that the one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days. I used to think that that's the when Yahweh Shai ascended into heaven. When I took another look at this, the ancient of days is on the earth. Let's scroll up to the first time. Right there. And I beheld that the thrones were cast down, the ancient of days did sit. What is this happening? On the earth. His garment was white as snow, and his hair was here like pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels were like burning fire. Scroll back up. So the, so the Ancient of Days is, is on the earth, and he basically took out the little horn. Go back to verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. That means he's coming from heaven with the clouds. He's coming from heaven in the clouds. And he came to the Ancient of Days. Where the Ancient of Days at? He's on the earth. And they brought him near before him. That was giving him dominion, glory, kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which should not pass away, and his kingdom that was, should not be destroyed. So what is going on right there? The ancient of days got authority over the earth, and he puts he puts Yahweh over that dominion. 
basically over Israel and over the whole earth. All right? So what is the Ancient of Days going to do? He's going to be God, but he's going to be in the earth with his son, Yahweh. Really, it's really the Ancient of Days, Yahweh is really ruling. All right? But Yahweh is the one that died for his people. But be there as king of the Jews again. Be in the land of Israel. And he's going to be definitely ruling over there. But the one that's majorly ruling in that day is the, is the father. So it's not Yahweh that's the major ruling factor. Yahweh Shai gave the kingdom back to the father. All right? Go to Acts chapter 1. And then we're going to be ready to get hauled on this. This is long enough video. Kind of long winded. Acts chapter, scroll down just a little right there. For the one. So the disciples actually, how was I, when he rose from the dead, were you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So that's in what, verse? Uh, go, go to verse 6. And when they were therefore come together, that means Yahweh and his disciples, they asked him, the disciples asked him, saying, Adon, our Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? All right, so if he got all power in his hand, will you at this time restore king, the kingdom to Israel? What does Yahweh say? Verse 7. He said unto them, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. See that? So the, the kingdom is the Father. Let's do a search. We'll do another search. Put my kingdom of my Father. See if it brings it up. Okay, let's see. Go to Matthew 26, 29, the last one. The last one right there. All right. Scroll up one. Okay, now they was at Passover meal. All right, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the mission of sins. Verse 29, But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of this vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So guess whose kingdom he's going to drink the fruit of the vine he's going to do Passover with? But his disciples, the Father's kingdom. So when will the Father's kingdom be here? When when Yahweh Shai is reigning, as Yahweh be over. All right? That means it's going to happen before the millennium. So right, that's why I say that the Father is the one that's coming. Right now, the Son is reigning, is reigning as vice All right, He's a vicar of Yahweh, reigning on the throne while the Father is descending into the earth and becoming, he's becoming the Father again. And what's going to happen is the sun is going to happen in the sun's reign. That death is going to be put up under his feet. When that happens, it's going to be the father's king. That's when the Israel is going to be restored. So what you see with the, with the, with the eclipses and all of that going on, is that the father is on his way. Not the sun. The sun is reigning as Yahweh. The father is reigning not as Yahweh, but he's on his way. He's becoming one more scripture to see if, see if we can do this real quick. I'm going to go to Exodus because I want I want the Hebrew language on. But we see that the angel of Yahweh is, is, was calling himself the God of Abraham, God of Jacob, Isaac, and God of Jacob. Exodus chapter 3, verse 2. Scroll down a little bit. He's talking to Moses. Okay. Right there. Verse 13, Exodus chapter 3, verse 13. Moses said unto God, which is the angel in the bush, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel, and shall, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Verse 14. And God, or Allah I am, said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said that that is his name. Why did he tell Moses, I am that I am? Basically, he's telling Moses what he is, what he's going to do. Uh, that word, I am, look, click on that. 
Hebrew 1961. He's telling what he's going to do, but he later tells me his name, Jeju Jihawa. Yeah, right there. Haya. Some people think they you know a Haya is his name, but the Haya is something that he's going to do, not his name. He's going to he's going to be your Haya. He's going to do Haya. What is doing Haya? Means he's, he means to exist. That is to be or become. So he's going to become. That means he's going to come down from heaven to earth. He's going to become. Come to pass. All right. To become. To accomplish. The great cause to come to pass. Continue. Okay. We took out of that. So basically what he's going to do. He's going to become. So when you see it says he was, it is, and is to come. Hey, basically, he's talking about higher. He says he is the Almighty who was, he was, was, is, and is to come. So this God that was, is, and is to come, he's becoming. He's going to come down here and become. All right? And show you that he's not a higher. It says, and he said, thus shall you say unto the children of Israel, I am, which is higher, has sent me unto you. And, and Allah Hayam said moreover unto Moses, thus shall thou say unto the children of Israel, Yahweh Allah Hayam of your fathers, the God, the Allah Hayam of Abraham, Allah Hayam of Isaac, the Allah Hayam of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever. So what is his name forever? Yahweh Allah Hayam. So when he becomes, when he's becoming, his name is Hayah. He's a, he's a higher. It's hard to say that. He's higher in. He's becoming. Where is he becoming at? Not in heaven. He's becoming down here. And this Yahweh becoming down here on earth is what's going to change the whole world. This is the big thing we've been waiting on for forever. Yahweh becoming down here in the world is bigger than Yahweh Shai becoming. Yahweh Shai is his son, but the father becoming is going to be big time. That's what he means by Haya, I am, has sent me unto you. So he started this way back when, he, when, when they were in Egypt at the, at the Passover. So this Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread is special because he's now finishing up. He's, he's, he's at the end of the coming. So that's what these, 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 uh, these eclipses and all of that stuff is about. It's about the Father who is the higher. He's becoming. All right? That's what that's about. And you see, he was the angel, and the angel said that he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That same angel came back and wrote, descended from heaven, descended in the white robe, and rolled the stone away when Yahweh rose up from the dead. All right? And, th and that was a great earthquake. So what happens at the sixth seal? There's a great earthquake. All right? Stars fall from heaven, as if shaking of a mighty wind. There's a there's an earthquake and then an eclipse, all the same stuff that you expect. So what's happening? At the sixth seal, Revelation chapter six, verse twelve, something took place where the Father basically did something in the world that's basically gonna change the whole world. Big time. What do you what I think he what had happened at the sixth seal? I think the father was going through something, kind of like me, what I'm going through. He was going through so in Isaiah 53. Not only did the son go through sickness, the son didn't go through sickness. He was basically cured. But there's somebody in Isaiah 53 that's going through sickness because he's, he's a man acquainted with grief. Click on that word grief, find out it means sickness. If Yahweh was going through sickness, he wouldn't have been a perfect sacrifice for man. So who was that that was going through sickness in Isaiah 53? It's the father. What happens is the father was, was, was supposed to die Go to Psalm chapter uh, 102. The father was supposed to die, but he didn't. What took place? Yahweh Shai's resurrection took place for him. So Yahweh Shai's resurrection happened to the father, but the father didn't die. The father was basically appointed to destined to die. Go to Psalm 102. Uh, it goes right there. 102, scroll. This is what's going on in the world right now with these eclipses and all that stuff that's going on. The Father's coming. No, one more. One more down right there. Scroll down to verse 18. Okay. 
the verse uh, Psalm 102, verse 18, this shall be written for the generation to come. And people shall be people which shall be created shall praise Yahweh. Verse 19, for he looked down from, from the height of his sanctuary. Who did? Yahweh. For he looked down from the height of his sanctuary from heaven did Yahweh behold the earth to hear the groaning of the prisoners, to loose those that are appointed to death. Why did he do that? Because one of those people that's appointed to death was who would be him in the latter days. So he would basically be appointed to death. And guess what? The Lamb of God, let me say that again, the Lamb of God, let me say it one more time, the Lamb of Israel? No. The Lamb of God, basically his sacrifice was appointed for the Father. All right? It was for the Father. He's the Lamb of the Father. Why would, why would Yah need a Lamb? Unless Yahweh would come down here himself. And just like any other man, they need a lamb, they need a sacrificial death. That's what happened. All right? So the father would come down and need the lamb. And the lamb's sacrifice would take him out of death. He won't die. This is impossible for Yahweh to die. But he would be he would be afflicted. And all their all their afflictions, he was afflicted with his people. That's uh, Isaiah, what is it, Isaiah 63? And all the affliction he was afflicted? An angel of his presence saved him, Isaiah 63. So in all their afflictions, not only was Yahweh afflicted, the father was afflicted. So this is to hear the groaning of the prisoner, would the father be in prison? To loose those that are appointed to death, would the father be appointed to death? Look at that word appointed there, Hebrews 11, 21. Let's see what that is. Well, appointed to death. Appointed from now to verse 20. See the word appointed at the end of the sentence. Bond. So he'd be a son as if the son of death. At least those that are sons. Basically, bond of being means son. All right? So he's a son of death. To lose those that are a, a, a son, lose those that are sons of death. That means he would die just like anybody else. But he already took care of that with the sacrifice of Yahweh Shai 2,000 years ago. So why do you think you see the angel, which is basically said, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, descending from heaven, rolling the stone away, with a white robe on? Why do you think you see that? But a white robe on that the saints are supposed to be wearing, unless the father becomes a human being. He'd be appointed to death. That's where the sixth seal takes place, because he will not be dead when it when it happens. He'd be going through, and God's gonna loose him from being appointed to death. You can click out of it. God's gonna loose him from being appointed to death. Now, really, you think about that, that Yahweh, he could not die, but at least he basically was afflicted for his people. One more, go to Isaiah. I'm going to show you that in Isaiah. Isaiah 63. Go up, back up. Back up. Up a little bit more. No. Right there. Go to 63. Isaiah 63, 61, 62. Scroll down a little bit more. Isaiah 62, 63. Scroll up. Isaiah 63, verse 9. It says, in all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved him. See that? In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them and buried them and carried them all the days of old. See that? So in all their, in all their affliction. So not only was Yahweh Shai afflicted and died, but the father came down and was afflicted. The son basically had a good life. He was rejoicing and all of that. But the hard part was the end of his life when he bore the affliction. It's going to be opposite with the father. The father is going to be afflicted in his life all right. 
excuse me, he's going to be afflicted in his life. He won't be like Yahweh Shai that was accepted and all of that. Probably nobody would know who the father is. But the father would be afflicted. And then he'd be taken out of the affliction like as if being taken out of death. All right? What happened when the father is taken out of that affliction? Go to Psalm. I know I'm along with it on this. Psalm 21. What happened when the father is taken out of this affliction? When the, when the sixth seal happens? Scroll down. Right there. Nope. Up. Oh, right there. Go to chapter 21. Right, he's right there. Nope. Right there. This psalm is of David. Now, who is David talking about? Right here, David is talking about Yahweh himself. The king shall joy in thy strength, O Yahweh. And in, sal in thy salvation, how greatly shall he rejoice. He's going to be in the sun, and the sun is going to be in him. The word for salvation is Yahweh Shai. And then uh, Yahweh Shai, how greatly shall he rejoice. Thou hast given him his heart's desire, and has not withholding the request of his lips. But I prevented him with blessings of goodness, and set up a crown of pure gold on his head. You see in the psalm on the first seal, somebody's been he's riding a white horse, somebody's got a crown was given unto him. He asked life of thee, thou givest it to him, long life, length of days, long even length of days, forever and ever. Let me read that again. He asked life of thee, thou givest it him. Even length of days forever and ever. His glory is great in thy salvation, thy Yahweh Shah. Let me read that again. His glory is great in thy Yahweh Shah. So, how is the Father doing this? Because he's going to be in Yahweh Shah. He's going to come down like any other human. It has to be saved. All right? Let me read that again. His glory is great in thy Yahweh Shah. Honor and majesty has thou laid upon him. Who is this? Is Yahweh Shah? No. It's the Father. Yahweh Shai said it. I am in the Father and the Father is in me. So just like the saints, all the saints are in Yahweh Shai, they're in the body of Christ. When his Father comes down, he's going to be in, guess who? I'm going to be in Yahweh Shai. See? With thy has made him most blessed forever. Thou has made him exceedingly glad with thy countenance. Yeah. Really something else. So who is the one that's going to sit on the throne with Yahweh Shai that he's talking about in the book of Revelation? Revelation chapter 3. He that overcome it, well, I grant it sit with me in my throne even as I overcome and sit down with my father in his throne. It's the father. He overcame and sat down with the father in his throne. The father's going to overcome and sit down with him in his throne in the temple. Except he be in the holy of holies. All right. That's what's going on. That's what we've been waiting on for the last 2,000 years to take place. Now we're at the end of it. The Father's coming. The kingdom is the Father's. All right? And Yahweh is reigning by his endurance. He's reigning in Yahweh's place. Why, why is he reigning in his place? That means Yahweh is doing something different that he's never done before. All right? He got somebody else in his place while he's doing something. What is he doing? Well, I just explained it to you. All right. Praise Yahweh. I pray that everybody's blessed with this video. And you, 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 just study it. Just look at it. It's right there in the Bible. Study it. Let, it. let it be part of your study. It's right there. All right? The devil would not have us know that. As a matter of fact, he would have Yahweh basically die. Now, check this out. If Yahweh dies, all things cease to exist. If Yahweh dies, all things cease to exist. Or at least this, this creation ceases to exist. Yahweh will still live because it's impossible to kill him. But if he dies, all things will cease to exist. And I'm sure one more, one more scripture. Go to uh, Malachi. Go down, go down. Malachi, go down a little bit more. Right there. Go to verse chapter four. All right. Malachi chapter four, verse four says, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, as I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great 
Jericho day of the Lord. Now watch this. And you shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to the fathers. Let's not come and smite the earth with a curse. This is the latter days. We know that, we know that John the Baptist played the role of Elijah. But in the latter days, the John the Baptist is a partial fulfillment of his role in the latter days. And then he, who is Elijah in the latter days? This Elijah in the latter days has to be the father. All right? That means G, even Yahweh and John the Baptist were partial fulfillments. And if he doesn't come and he doesn't accomplish his worst, this work, he's going to smite the earth with what? It says right here, a curse. We click on that Hebrew 2764 to see what that word for curse in Hebrew is. The last verse, Hebrew 2764. Kareem. You know, some people, I see some people with the name Kareem, and I think it's probably uh, Arabic when they do that word Kareem. It might, it might mean something totally different in Arabic language, but in Hebrew, it means a curse. Watch this. Physically, a shutting, a shutting in a net. Is it literally a figure two? Usually a doomed object. Abstractly, extermination. So this Elijah, if he doesn't do his work, and doesn't finish it, guess what happens to the to mankind? It's all life on the earth. It, 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 it gets exterminated. Doomed. Cursed. So that lets you know that that person is really the father. Let me read that last part again. Go ahead and click out of that. He should turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to their fathers. As I come and smite the earth with a curse or extermination or doom. So that means even if the father, that if he dies, the whole earth dies. And I think that's probably the reason why Satan would want the father to die. He knows that the father cannot die and he's going to live forever. But if his, if his majesty on earth, if his manifestation on earth dies, all men will die on earth. All the creation will die. Since he become a man in the earth, he dies. All men, all creatures would die. That's why he said, let's come and smite the earth with a curse. Everything on the earth would have a curse, or have doom or extermination. I hope that makes sense to you. I know a lot of these things are mysteries, and these mysteries are starting to be fulfilled in the earth. All right, so I'm going to let you go. See you next week, which will be the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. If, you, if you're keeping the feast, be blessed. If you're not, whenever you keep the feast, be blessed. In that feast, all right, the way you're keeping it. By Hashem, Yahweh, Hashem, Amen. Probably want to know, right? Stop recording, go down one more, right there. Stop recording.